My Lupus Living Room is a place to listen to the stories of ordinary, everyday people who are not afraid to share the struggles and successes of living with a chronic illness called lupus. These brave lupians put it all out there to bring us all in. We celebrate people living with lupus. My name is Suzanne. I am a mom, a wife, a business owner, and the CEO of the Lupus Foundation of America's Great Ohio Chapter, and a whole lot more. But most of all, I have lupus. My purpose and my passion are to help other people with lupus. For me, lupus was a lonely, miserable, misunderstood disease. And I'm here to tell you that today, it doesn't have to be. I want to talk more about the things we do not normally talk about. Since lupus impacts mostly women, my lupus living room will have a focus on what it's like to be a woman living with this mysterious, unpredictable disease that has no cause or cure. I know that many would love to connect with others that have lupus. These women are fearless and have extraordinary stories of survival. I'm excited to welcome my not-so-famous guests and with their inspiring stories that offer hope and inspiration to fellow lupians. I believe this project will not only create awareness about lupus, but offer encouragement to those listening. Remember, there is no I in the word lupus, but there is the word us. The Lupus Foundation of America, Great Ohio Chapter is here for you. For your chance to share your story and visit with me, you can reach out to me at Suzanne at Lupus Great Ohio or call 1-888-NO-LUPUS. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to my lupus living room. This is Suzanne Turney, CEO and president of the Lupus Foundation of America's Greater Ohio Chapter. And I am really excited this afternoon because I have two not so famous guests, but they are uh, famous in my heart. They've been with the Lupus Foundation chapter here. Oh, it's got to be over a decade now. Um, They've been uh, staunch supporters. They've been support group members, leaders, walk volunteers, envelope stuffers, um, ice cream social, uh, you name it, they've done it. I've asked and they've always rose. And so I want to welcome Beverly and Virgil Humphreys. And they are an absolute delight to be with me today. And I just want to have a casual conversation on them because they're unique. Uh, Beverly has lupus, um, her husband. She is so blessed <clears throat> to have this man. I've never seen support from a spouse before. And he has always risen to the occasion to speak to other couples, uh, uh, the men especially, when they have been new- newly diagnosed as couples. And um, let's just hear a little bit more from them. So, Bev, what's going on? How you been doing? Yeah. Not really great. Weather changing has um, activated my lupus flare. Um, Joints are achy and swollen at this time. So I'm trying to get past the weather change at this time. Yeah. But other than that, I hang in in there. You know, it's incredible. She looks great. So it's that typical lupus stigma that comes yes. with us that, but you don't look sick, yeah. you know. Uh, why don't you give us a little history, um, give our audience a little history on how you came to the Lupus Foundation mm-hmm. and uh, what your journey's been like mm-hmm. to this point. Well... I didn't originally come to the Lupus Foundation on a volunteer basis. When I first found out I had lupus, was told by my doctor that I had lupus, I was in denial. And I kept working, having a hard time getting up, coming home early. And this went on for a year or so. And um, my husband decided to do some research on his own. And unbeknownst to me, he found a lupus foundation. And he 
came out and talked to Suzanne without me. And they had a conversation. And then he must have waited about a week or so. And he told me that he found somebody he wanted me to meet that knew about lupus. Of course, I did not want to meet anybody, let alone Suzanne. I wanted to be in my own misery with my own self, continue to work, and just be by myself with my new diagnosis that I didn't understand. But eventually, he said to me, well, let's go for a ride. That's how it started. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing I know, I am at the Lupus Foundation in Brexville. And there is Suzanne in a little room and she stands up and go, hi, I'm Suzanne. She had already met Virgil and let alone, I was really ticked off at that time. A long time. So <laughs> my conversation first meeting with Suzanne was nothing but tears. I did not talk to Suzanne. I did not talk to my husband. Mm -hmm. They had the conversation and I listened and cried. So that is my introduction to my first lupus meeting here with Suzanne and Virgil. Yeah, so my memory, that's exactly right. So you're doing great. That's exactly what happened. Virgil showed up at my, my doorstep in my little office and he said, I got this problem, you know, and, and he was he was fishing for information. I thought, wow, this is great. Where did they find this guy at? I mean, how many men do that? I thought it was, wow very, very unusual and very, very special. Um, but then when he did get uh, Beverly to um, join us, much resistance and hostility, okay? And, you know, I, I, it surprised me, but today it doesn't surprise me. It actually kind of reminds me a little bit of me. When my mother drugged me to a lupus meeting, I went kicking and screaming. I don't have anything to do with it. You I know? did. You know, so we were both kicking and streaming, and, and at the end of the day, look at us now. What what an impact we've had in other people's lives. So, Virgil, what would you like to add to that little story? First of all, she didn't talk to me for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I got beat up big time, big time. Yeah. But I am so proud of the fact that she settled in and started participating, and we started working with the Lupus Group, which has been, for me, it's been a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is this couple, how many years have you been married now? 45. 45 years. Oh. Okay. No? Oh, oh, you're getting chest pains? Don't do that now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that now. You, you scare me. Uh, 45 years, and gosh, I'm trying to think, I don't know, maybe I've known you 10, 15 years. I don't know, because they've become an extension of my family. Uh, our families know each other and we celebrate and, and we mourn together. And uh, I've seen tremendous triumphs and challenges throughout their journey. Um, and having lupus is bad enough, but having so many challenges that you've had uh, and you're still together and you're still here, you know, it's a miracle. You, you guys have been blessed 10 times 10. That's what love um, is. 10 times 10. But how did you get through those? I don't know if you want to share some of those tragedies and how did you get through them? Well, I think first, my first loss was my mother. mother. I had lupus at the time of my mother's illness. Um, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. And um, <clears throat> she had the surgery, um, then she had radiation, she refused chemo. So I became her caregiver during my lupus journey. Um, it was hard trying to take care of her and take care of me. And there was days I was hurting more than she was hurting. 
and I was still trying to work at the same time. Yeah, yeah so Bev has a nursing background as well. And so um, my, I had a boss that was pretty understanding that allowed me to come in in the evening even when I missed days. So between taking care of my mom and trying to keep her on the right path. And then we moved her into our house. And so I became her sole caregiver myself. Mm -hmm. um, and that was pretty hard, pretty. And it was a big adjustment for her as well. But um, her last day, she wanted to go back home to her home. And so I kind of went with her to take care of her. And as the disease progressed, um, we decided on hospice. And um, I stayed with her in hospice that was not working. And then my mom passed. And after my mom passed, my brother got sick. Um, and between that time, Virgil's brother, youngest brother, who was a minister in um, Huntsville, Alabama. In that meantime, he was getting ready to go to his church. He's a pastor of a church, went to his closet and he dropped dead from a heart attack. That was the first news we got. And then the second news we got was my brother was in the VA they didn't exactly know what was wrong with him, but to come to find out that he had Agent Orange from Vietnam and he passed very <clears throat> suddenly. You know, interesting, there's some controversy about Agent, Agent Orange with lupus connections. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, what, whatever came of that, but I remember that, you know, it just rang a bell with me mm -hmm. that I wonder whatever it became of that, that a lot of VA people um, with Agent Orange had lupus. Both my brothers passed from Agent Orange right behind each other. Wow. Wow. Okay. They both died at 59 from Agent Orange. That's incredible. So. Um, and then here at home with your son, sons. Yeah, I, <clears throat> we have five children in total, four boys, one girl. And we, lost one of our sons last year, right after New Year's, January 2nd. It was not expected. We did not know he was ill. Um, he went into the VA because he wasn't feeling well and they admitted him. <clears throat> he called me and we, um, we talked about 45 minutes or so, and he asked me for dinner. And in the meantime, I fixed dinner and Virgil took it up to him. And I have a picture of him on my phone with him eating the dinner. And he called me and said how good it was. And my next call was from his physician saying that they went in to check on him and he had passed. Wow. Well. Was it, was it heart? Yes. Heart? It was his heart. Oh, we're sorry for your he loss. Just, he had passed from a heart attack. So. But you do have a miracle with your other son. I have another son who mm -hmm. was a Cleveland police officer. Um, he had been on the police force for many years, and he loved his job. Um, and they were radioed to a Pacific place, which I will not state. And as the car was going, um, it was a chase. And uh, during this chase, he was badly injured. Matter of fact, they didn't expect him to make it. He was brain dead. He had broken his ribs, broken his right knee and leg. He was in CCU for two, two and a half weeks. 
And so we were all called to his bedside because they didn't think he was going to make it due to the brain bleed he had from the car accident because they had to pry him from the car. Needless to tell you, stress and lupus does not work very well. Mm. And I can tell you that firsthand because neither one of us ate or drank or went home and um it was really stressful and one of the doctors happened to notice that i was in stress and wanted to know what he could do for me and i had to explain to him that i had lupus and there was nothing he could do for me right now because it was all stress related but the good news is my son recovered our son recovered, but he's not the same, but we still have him. So God blessed us to still have him around. He's not able to work and we are his legal guardians for the rest of his life. Uh, what's interesting is, um, you know, even, even though he had some challenge, ended up with some challenges, this big, handsome guy. Okay, and uh, he has volunteered for us many times for security. Uh, I know down at the poker fest and at the walks and, and whatever uh, Beverly and Virgil tells him to do to help, he, he rises. And uh, he's, was he was part knows. of the police family. And so during this time, they were surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of police constantly, constantly, constantly. And how she <laughs> survived all that stress, um, um, and hopefully she'll share with us. But th then it didn't end there. Okay, there's going to be a happy ending here somewhere, I promise you. Okay, and then, they're, then their house burnt down. I was like, what? And the cars. What the heck? My Lincoln. Your Lincoln. Yeah. It's like, how does this happen yeah. to you, Bev? Yeah. Well, Virgil, I had went somewhere. I don't know where I went. I, I can't remember. <clears throat> But I know I left him at home and we have about an acre of land and he must have been out in the backyard. And um, my son came to pick me up wherever I was at. And he was awful quiet that day. And I, and I said to him, I said, why are you so quiet? And he says, oh, no, I don't know. Just wait till we get home. Eric. And as I, we pulled up to the house, he pulled up on the corner of my house and I see all these fire engines, police cars and people. And I happen to look up and my house is in a flames of shooting from my house, from the roof of my house. And so I started running towards my house and my son grabbed me and my neighbor across the street grabbed me. And um, I stood across the street and watched all that we worked for and owned burn. Yeah. Virgil, were you in the house? Were you in the house? I was in the yard working. She told you I have, well, we have an acre. Another miracle. Yeah. And I was in the yard and I saw what was going on and I grabbed I, I ran up to the house, grabbed the hose line, and I'm putting the fire out, right? You're hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're hoping. <laughs> Till one of the officers came and just drugged me away. Yeah. Said, you can't do this. Yeah. But um, it, it was just so hard to watch everything that we had worked for go up in flame. Disappear. What a mess. Disappear. I can't even imagine. You you see that going around the world today with the storms and the damages and the wars. And, and when you lose everything like that, stress isn't even a word. What you a know, tragedy. It, it's un, uh, probably un, undescribable. And then, then we build the house, okay? And then Virgil decides to not really pay attention to his body, okay? And his wife's got to beat him over the head to go to the doctor, and he goes in for a checkup and my, well, this is the story that I got is that, oh, you, you may have some heart issues. You may, you may have some blockages and need surgery. And he says, he's going to go home and think about it. Okay. <laughs> it's like, what the <laughs> heck is there to think about? <laughs> so he's thinking about it in the midst of his thinking about this, 
we were sitting there just chit chatting, just a normal conversation. I don't even know what the conversation was about. And he just hmm. kind of closed his eyes and leaned his head to the side. And I looked at him and I walked over to him and I put my hand on his chest. There was no breathing. So I put my face up on his nose. There was no breath. And I tried to pull him. He's in a recliner chair. So I said, dear Lord, that's all I could say was, Lord, help me. And I tried to pull him out of the chair and I couldn't. But since he was in a recliner chair, I just leaned the recliner chair back. And we have a wooden stool up on our counter we have. And I just leaned it back and started the CPR. You know, between the pumping and the breathing and the pumping and the breathing. And I happened to look over and there was the cell phone. I mean, a house phone. So I threw the house phone on his chest, hit 911. And I was started yelling my address into the phone. And, um, and I said to them, my husband's having a heart attack and I'm doing CPR. And I just kept saying my address over and over and over and over. I could finally hear the sirens coming, but... I couldn't remember if the door was locked or unlocked. I couldn't remember. And something said, go check the door. And it just so happened the door was locked. So I unlocked the door, went back, started to CPR. And I don't know how I got from Virgil to the sofa. I don't know that, but they came in and they worked on it. And how him. many ribs did you break of his, this tiny little girl beating up on uh, her husband? I I don't know. But you saved his life. But, yeah. And that was another journey. That was another yeah, journey. I will say that my chest was sore when she finished. <laughs> and not only that, she worked so hard to get, get uh, my heart pumping she pounded on my chest so hard that her right shoulder got a big knot about six, six inches mm -hmm. tall where she was just using force to uh, bring me you, back you together. You do what you got to do. You do what you got. And you survived mm -hmm. and COVID came. And I was checking in, checking in. And she was so down and so blue. And she, we really didn't think you were going to make it. Really didn't think, and I'd call every once in a while because I didn't want to bother her. And then one day you answered the phone and was like, what the heck? <laughs> He's back. God is good. So tell me, Beverly, you have this disease of lupus and probably other autoimmune issues mm -hmm. as well. You, you've been through, we we as patients complain all the time and and we have stress and a lot, of, a lot don't work because they don't feel good or for other multiple reasons, but yet you kept champing and champing and champing. This is, this isn't normal. And you've been on different meds, right? You've, tr you've tried a different yeah. types of therapy. So share some of those things and, and your experiences. And, and this isn't to negate that any more wrong. Cause remember all of us, we respond to medications differently, but you did try various different, um, Techniques. So when one failed, you went to another, and then you went to another. So you want to share mm. that with us? Well, um, I think the first one was um, uh, the first one was steroids. Um, they had me on um, steroids for a while. I, I never went straight to the Plaquenil. I was on steroids for a while. Then I went to the Plaquenil. I, I stayed in the emergency on my first journey with lupus because I didn't quite understand it. I didn't know what I had, really. And um, as time went on, I finally got in touch with a doctor again that my husband found that 
um, did the testing and finally diagnosed me with the lupus. And so um, she tried the steroids at first and then the Plaquenil. We went on the methotrexate, was it? Methotrexate. You? Methotrexate, yeah. And um, after a while, it didn't work. And so what they're doing for me right now, because I stay in such a state of flare, is I do what they, an infusion. Infusion. And the infusion, I, this, it's a cocktail. I go to an infusion center out in Medina. Mm -hmm. And it's with um, Benadryl, a little morphine or Valium, and um, some methotrexate. And um, I just had one last month. It normally goes from six to eight hours. They called me last week to come in next week for another one because I'm still in a state of a, what they consider a high flare at this time. So I go in on next Monday at eight o'clock for another <clears throat> infusion per the doctors because they felt like they got to do something to bring this flare down because my blood pressure goes high and I, I don't have an appetite. The migraine kicks in. And I also get infusions for the migraine. I have a migraine specialist who understands lupus. Mm -hmm. So she works with me with the migraines and the lupus. The lupus are hereditary from my dad's side. Okay. You know, my, my kids had them, my brothers have them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they help work with the migraine and the lupus together to kind of calm the body down. So how long does the infusion take? Six to eight hours. Six. So you have to do that twice? Mm -hmm. Like a month or every other no. month? No. Oh. Uh, it's, normally, it's normally like twice a year. Mm -hmm. But because I'm in such a high state at this time, they want to do another one to see if they can bring it down because my blood pressure goes so high. So explain to the audience, what does a flare mean to you? My flare to my flare for me is my joints hurt, my muscles hurt, I'm fatigued, I want to lay down, I get a headache, I don't want to talk to anybody. I normally isolate myself. Um, because of the pain, um, there's no way to really get rid of the pain. And all you want to do is just lay down and kind of be still. Mm -hmm. So you can try to just relax. So that's what my flare does. Sometimes I, my ankles swell, my hands are swell. I can't get my rings on. Um, if I put on socks, you can really see the swelling in my feet. Mm -hmm from where I had socks on. So <clears throat> that's how the flare affects me. And sometimes it will trigger the migraines. And my migraines is only on the right side of my face. It's not my whole head. It's on the right side. And um, some people have them all over, but I have it on the right side. And it's not unusual just to have it on one side rather than the whole head. Mm -hmm. So I'm also being treated. So do you have a team of doctors or uh, how many I do. different? You, so you, I have a team of doctors that work with the lupus and the migraine. That's um, the issues right now is the lupus and the migraines. And I also have a psychiatrist. Okay. Okay. Um, I felt I, I needed to get that because I was having some issues and I felt like I needed some therapy. Mm -hmm. And so I recognized that. And um, I told my husband I needed therapy. 
Sure. So I recognized that and I got a a therapist to kind of help me through the rough spot in the illness because sometimes I'm nonverbal. I'm nonverbal when I'm not feeling well, I'm in pain, I'm hurting. Um, I don't want to sound like a hypochondriac. Yeah. So you know, uh, there's a couple of things here. One is when the patient becomes the caregiver, you became the caregiver, you're the patient, and you became the caregiver multiple times during your journey. And I I'm blown away at, at your survival and your stamina. So where did you get that kind of strength from? How'd you I, do it? I don't know. I, I tell people my grandmother raised me. I was raised Thank by God for grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I recognize a lot of me in her. And she had 13 children. Oh geez. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. <laughs> She had 13 children, 10 girls and three boys. Wow. And I see a lot of myself and my grandmother. <clears throat> and I have a lot of her habits and her ways. As my family would say, I'm grandmother second. Mm -hmm. All right. And I thank God for her because she taught me a whole lot. Because she was like the backbone of the family. And since... I, she raised me, she raised me until she died. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of her ways and I try to think about things that she did when stress hit her, <clears throat> you know, one of the things she would say was Lord help. I say that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I may not say it out loud, but inside I say it, you know, because there lies my faith. Yeah. Oh, so I would echo that. Let go like God. You know, because sometimes it's just big. It's so big. It's just so big. Yeah. There lies my faith. And there's some things that when the plate overflows, I just have to turn it over there to the go. Lord and let him do what he do best. I need to do that. I have a <laughs> I usually have a buffet going on. I'm just going to turn the whole table over. Wow. Well, I just let my plate overflow. I I'm I've learned to just let the plate go. Wherever it goes, it goes. Because I can't do anything about it. I'm I'm human. And I I notice that the older I get, the worse the lupus gets. I don't know about anybody else. Mm -hmm. For for me, the older I get, the more I feel like the pain is more, the muscle aches is more, mm -hmm. and I have what um, they describe as a buffalo hump on the back of my neck, mm -hmm. which hurts every day, all day. Do you, do you also have uh, lupus along with fibromyalgia? I have fibromyalgia, lupus, Sjogren's, Sjogren's um, um, you have sacral blood. iliac. Um, okay. Well, I have noticed that there's much less of you. Yes, there is. Um, I'm. Well, right now I'm to the point where I really have no appetite. Um, I've been to the doctor and they don't understand why <clears throat> I don't have an appetite. Um, I don't have an ulcer. Um, my blood work was okay. My um, white blood cells was just a little low, but not enough to affect anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I, I, at this time and point, I'm stressed, mm -hmm. and but there's nothing I can do about the stress. So, I'm so just you you were gonna getting some you're getting some mental therapy, which exactly. I think is fabulous. You know, I, I went that route myself, mm -hmm. and it was very very helpful. Um, and then I look at Virgil, who's always held you up, and I know you've been holding him up mm -hmm. for a while. So, Virgil, what would you say to couples? 
you know, your role in all of this, um, how did you get through it? Or, or how did you see your role with Beverly and helping her through the, all these different things that have happened? Not just the lupus, just all the other life. Life comes at you. First thing is a lot of prayer. Yeah. I do a lot of it. And I have done a lot of that. And we just do things together. When she is sick and has to go to the doctor, I go there. When she is in the hospital, I go there. And then my life turns to whatever is needed for her to get better. So I ask the doctor questions to find out what is needed, what I can do to help. Yeah, you're very inquisitive. Yeah. I, I I've am. noticed that. He, he, he's no, no bashful you. You know, you're very inquisitive. Yeah, well, the only way to solve a problem is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. When I came into you the first day, I asked a lot of questions because I, I, I wanted to know what was going on that I could help with or what was going on that I could take her to. The first thing I thought of was, let's go to the lupus meeting. Mm -hmm. And it helped. It helped a great deal. Uh Basically, we, we do everything together. When you see her, you'll generally see me. Yeah, he has a saying. Do you remember that saying? Because it always sticks with me. <laughs> we have lupus. There you go. We have yep, lupus. We do have lupus. When, when, when they're sitting at the support group table and they introduce, when they go do the round robin, he introduced, he goes, we, and I'm Virgil, and we have lupus. I love it. I love it. I just, just want to steal it. I'm always so jealous because you're never going to see Bill at one of these things, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I see a lot of women that come, but he is a good guy. There's a, a lot of oh, single women come, and, of course, the couples that would come. And I think when Virgil was around, more couples would come. Uh, because you know, I think there was a strength there that uh, you know, guys are just a little bit different. Don't don't take that any way other than a good thing. Um, but they express themselves differently. So you've always been a real pleasant addition to the to the group. And I'm hoping to bring the group back uh, for, since COVID, because COVID has changed everything that we do in life. But um, we're going to wrap up our conversation. But uh, you know. What would you say? So they're a beautiful minority couple here. They're black and they're gorgeous. And and it's Minority Health Month still, right? You're going to push this out, Alex? What would you say to minority couples or to people with lupus um, about education or support or anything at all? Well, one of the things I would say, it took a long time to get diagnosed. Don't give up. Find out what's wrong with you. Not to say you have lupus, but get a second opinion or a third opinion because that's what I had to do because I didn't know what was wrong. But I knew something was wrong because it was unusual. And I guess the next thing I would say is take some me time take some me time the world is hectic families friends work home and take some me time and when you can't do it anymore just sit down and like i say lord help is that all you can say that's all you can say just sit down and say lord help there you go and virgil what would you add to that well what I would say is that I try to be attentive to her needs because there's times when she's in such denial about her aches and pains that I have to look at that and know what it is and talk yeah, to her about it. Because if you look at her, she looks great. And I know she's miserable. Yeah. 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 So we do that. We do a lot of talking. And... Uh, since I retired, <laughs> oh my! You know, I I can't. I do have to ask you this. She's nine. You had nine siblings, nine sisters. 
No, my no. grand my oh, grandmother. Oh, I was going to say, how did you deal with that? No, my grandmother had thirteen children. Okay, were they all part of your world? Did yeah. you know all these folks? Yeah, he know he knew my. Aunt. I I can't even imagine being yeah. around that many women at one time from the same family. Oh, he was <laughs> the first family reunion he went to. I forewarned him mm -hmm. that there were more women than men. Tons of them. And they Tons were of them. very outspoken. Imagine what comes that. Up, comes out. And I forewarned him about my family. And when he went, he was in awe mm -hmm. because there were so many women and so few men. And they're all strong women. Yeah. And but I bet you they all they fell in love with you, Virgil. Yeah, and they like to do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is their favorite thing to do with In him. case you're listening, she's rubbing his beard. <laughs> I'm rubbing his beard. <laughs> <She's> rubbing his <laughs> beard. They like his beard. They said it's soft. So oh. they all like to go up and rub his face. So when we go and visit my family, I take wipes <laughs> because they all like to Jeez. feel his face, well, his beard. I could speak to them um, for hours, okay? And they've been a wonderful addition to my life and to our lupus community. And I want to thank you both for sharing um, your very personal stories, your ups and your downs, and and you you are an inspiration um, to many many couples. And uh, I would encourage if there's a couple out there listening to this, I'm sure if you want to talk to another couple, these two oh, have absolutely. such open doors absolutely. and and come over to the Brexwell Cleveland support group. Uh, we'll make sure if, if you're coming, we'll, we'll make sure they're, they're showing up here or maybe we can switch emails or something, but you don't have to do this alone. Okay. Uh, there is no I in lupus. And my favorite saying that I'm going to remember them by always is we have lupus. Okay. Uh, together <laughs> they have it. So um, thank you very much. And as you, always, yeah, our pleasure. It's, it's a treat. Thanks for coming in. As always, uh, your doctor is your best resource to tell you how to treat your lupus. This conversation today was a pleasant conversation with our fellow lupians, and we just wanted to share it with you. Thank you for coming to my lupus living room. If you'd like to share your story, uh, please um, feel free to contact us at www.lupusgreaterohio.org. And thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good. Aren't they cute? Remember, there is no I in lupus, but there is an us. Until next time, this has been my Lupus Living Room with the Lupus Foundation of America's Great Ohio Chapter. For more information and resources to help you in your lupus journey, please visit lupusgreatoohio.org or call 1-888-NO-LUPUS. The funding for my Lupus Living Room is an earmark from the state of Ohio and managed by the Ohio Department of Health. Your physician is the best person to help you in the treatment of lupus. The information you learn here today can be discussed with your doctor as your physician knows your medical history best. Please do not make any medical changes without consulting your physician first. As with any treatment, stay educated and get information from, from trusted sources. <music>